Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Art Salon. My name is Jens Hoffmann, and I'm very happy to introduce um, Claire Fontaine, who is sitting next to me here. Um, Claire Fontaine are involved with a number of projects here at Art Basel Miami. And one of the projects that uh, Claire Fontaine are doing is um, related to the Art Perform program, um, which is something that we are going to talk about. Um, but before we talk specifically about their performance piece that um, you're going to be able to see tomorrow, I would just like to uh, begin uh, by um, asking uh, my two guests um, to tell me who Claire Fontaine actually is. Well, Claire Fontaine is not a person and uh, it's not a fiction, I would say. It's the name of a, um, of a shared space that we have. Um, does it sound right, this microphone? Or there is a terrible echo or it's just me? Yes, it's on, but it sounds terrible. Okay, I'll keep it further. Uh, do you hear me like this? Yeah, okay. So yeah, Claire Fontaine is not, uh, is not a fiction, it's not a person, it's the name of a space of, um, of cooperation where uh, we can actually um, do things and uh, have ideas and create forms that we wouldn't create um, under our own names. So it's, um, it's a space, it's a shared space, I would say. The idea of working as an artist using a pseudonym has a long tradition. So I wonder where, where your practice would fit into that when you think about artists using another name to maybe work in a different way or to do things without um, uh, harming their reputation that they have while they were doing other things. And just curious if this is any, in, in any way a consideration that you had. Well, no, there, there are several ways to use a pseudonym that can be um, a kind of commercial practice, as you are describing, to not to identify with some alimentary things or with your, the name of your family. There are many also psychoanalytical uh, sides of this thing. But I think what, what is interesting is when collectives, for example, find a name for themselves and they work under one name that could be the name of a person. Like in, in our case, you don't actually know if it's one person or more persons when you see the name on paper. So I think it's this, it's this actual space of identification, of tautology, like uh, he is what he does, like breaking this identification between the persons and, and their work, which is actually um, a process that is not totally happening uh, in the performances that we've seen yesterday. Maybe we can talk about this later. But uh, there is a lot of, um, there's been two autobiographical performances last night and uh, people really cared about identifying with themselves and with their own work in the two case and with their, even with their childhood. So it's somehow even the cliche of the autobiography, the building of the artist it's something that is still very present in our way to, uh, to see things and to approach art. Do you want to add something to that? Maybe, James, uh, we could start talking a little bit about what's going to happen tomorrow. And I think uh, here on the computer screen you see uh, um, images that are related to uh, the performance that uh, you guys are going to do tomorrow. So. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, what we are seeing there and what your plans are? Um, what we're seeing on the screen is a, is a mannequin that is used for, for combat sports, for self-defense instruction. And so um, we have asked um, six professional fighters. Here in the images we have um, a kind of very... I guess a kind of street fighting method, which is extremely violent. Um, tomorrow at nine o'clock, we have six profes se seven professional um, fighters um, using Bob, this uh, mannequin, as a as a protagonist. Yeah, and this uh, exercise is not only a pedagogical exercise, but it's also, uh, of course, an allegory of, uh, of many um, 
uh, violent transactions going on uh, around us, not only in the art fair, but also in the art fairs, and uh, um, the violence that is going to be displayed uh, on, on this object is uh, somehow the, the mirror or the explicitation of uh, other types of violence that are circulating around us right here and right now. Could you be maybe a bit more explicit about uh, this? I think before when we had uh, when we were preparing here, I think you said some interesting things about um, maybe not physical, visual violence, but uh, how that is maybe underlying in some form of uh, uh, formation of our society. Yeah, I mean, the, the, um, there are several reasons for we have um, been fascinated by the idea of having Bob beaten up on stage one of. The reasons is that we have also used Bob as uh, ready-made. He's actually standing now in the Rina Spaulings stand, a little bit uh, hurt by the, the rehearsal. Uh, and we were really uh, interested in this anthropomorphic object being hit, actually, and becoming this receptacle of, uh, of hatred, whether the, all the other artworks that surround Bob are gonna be uh, preserved, stored, and uh, uh, treated with, um, with a lot of attention and care uh, according to their destiny when they get bought or they get exhibited, etc. Whether Bob is gonna be actually uh, mistreated um, on stage Saturday. So part one of the reasons is this reason of um, having a ready-made with a use value that uh, was an interesting uh, paradox that seemed uh, useful for us and also having a performance that involves um, an art object uh, inside but this is actually something that is happening uh, in other performances too we were talking about this with Jens but yeah there is a cathartic aspect in this violence that we can see that we will see on Saturday hopefully um, and uh, it's the fact that the audience Yesterday, for example, was really friendly and really comforted by the, the three performances, I think, that were interesting in many ways. Uh, and they were really participant. Um, and I do not think that the same um, phenomenon can happen on Saturday because the people that are going to be on stage are actually um, not intellectuals, they are not artists, and uh, they work uh, with their body, and um, they actually work in a self-destructive way that is also a self-defensive way. So they are uh, in this circle of wasting energy and giving energy to the public. So we are curious of seeing what this can produce. How, aware, how much aware are the fighters um, of what they are doing and what they are involved with? Does this matter to you? Yeah, it does because it's going to affect their behavior. I don't think they've ever performed in front of an art audience. They know that they are involved in an art performance, but then they don't know what an art performance is. So it's a bit like when we get invited to uh, do a performance, we more or less know the location. We know you, but we do not know exactly what we're going to do. So it's experimental for everybody. It can go totally wrong and it can be also fantastic. So it's, I mean, we are taking some risks. It's not... Uh, and so are they, actually, which is very uh, something that needs to be respected, I think, because uh, I think there is some kind of uh, courage that is involved in this, in this demonstration that they're going to make on Saturday. So it can also go totally wrong. Yeah, this is part of the, of the experiment. We will see. Well, we, uh, in our conversation before, uh, the talk here, we spoke a little bit about uh, how art fairs uh, expand into the directions of having other programs involved, film programs, talk programs, performance programs, etc., etc. And I wanted to return to this idea of art fair art, perhaps, and um, really hear from you how, how you feel operating in a context like an art fair as artists, particularly because... Uh, um, your work often also questions these type of systems, whether it's the art market, in art institutions, uh, hierarchies within that. Yeah, I think we're pretty much of a docile artist because we fit... Uh, we're pretty much of a docile artist in terms of the, 
of the formats that we adopt because we do not uh, challenge extremely the white cube nor uh, uh, any of the contexts that are given for the simple reason that we think that there is not such a thing like a good context to work in. So at the end of the day, showing your work in an art fair is not an humiliation for us and it's not something that particularly depresses us. It's, uh, there is a complete continuity between uh, showing the work in a gallery or a museum or an art fair. Of course, I mean, the work um, has to defend itself. Um, that's, one of, well, that's the title of the, of the performance. So it is within a, a logic of, a, of a relative um, conflict in the sense that anyway, to produce sense in life and to produce things that are worth it, you're always in a conflictual dynamic. So it's not something particularly strange. I guess uh, the creative process is, is, uh, is a conflictual one. Uh, any affective process is a conflictual one. So uh, the, the idea that uh, there could be a space that uh, is alien from conflict or that the white cube or the art fair are these spaces where the work is uh, respected and well treated are not exactly true. The, the work is always submitted to some violence and needs to be accompanied and so on. So that's the, your job. The curator has to take care of how the work is, is presented. So I think it's just one of the contexts, the art fair. Then the, the side program, I mean, we could ask questions to you. How do you feel in curating uh, a sort of uncommercial project aside of an art fair? Because this is an interesting kind of contradiction or an interesting situation to be in. It's your third time that you do this. So how does it feel? Well, I think the advantage of doing this was always for me to uh, be able to work with artists uh, such as you, often artists that I have uh, recently met that I felt uh, I wanted to collaborate with. And this platform here was something that uh, was available really quickly and instantly because it happened every year. It was on a small scale, so it was almost uh, like a date that I had with an artist where we could begin working on a small scale on a project and see if there could be potentially be something different. I think also the idea of uh, doing performances uh, in, in an art fair uh, came up just simply because there was no space for it. Uh, it was always the question, how do you present an art form like performance? Something that I think has also had a, a, a big comeback over the last years. How do you present it within the context of an art fair? The difference, though, I think here is really that most of the artists that we have invited for art perform have been artists who are not necessarily known as performance artists. And I think that sort of challenge uh, was something that was uh, important to me, taking artists out of the white cube and putting them um, on a stage. And of course, I guess um, that the art fair is a, is a, um, is a difficult environment. Uh, yesterday, we had the performance of Kelly Nipper uh, that required uh, a bit of focus from the audience, and I could uh, immediately sense how um, the audience was uh, beginning to move over to get uh, drinks and, and wander around. Um, so. It feels like you need to be on, on, on speed with these things in an environment like this where we over saturated really with visual impulses. Yeah, but I guess people come to an art fair to, to be entertained, to look at things. It's a, bit, it's a similar experience than going shopping. I think that's what actually it is. Uh, there are people that work in this shopping environment and there are uh, people that uh, entertain them and there are uh, people that uh, come shopping. So I guess, I mean, the dynamic is that when one of the entertaining aspects is not entertaining, people don't buy it and just leave. So I guess it's very actually interesting to see the, this disinhibited reaction because people don't pay to sit there. So if they're bored, they would just leave the stage. And in some ways, this is a challenge, I guess, to keep them. Uh, but but uh, I would say that uh, the artists that we could see yesterday were very docile within this challenge because they did something that was really thought for an audience and was somehow narrative and addressed the public and uh, the public didn't have uh, anything to fear. And they didn't put themselves in a situation of risk, which is something that is very different from uh, the history of uh, performance art. This is something we were talking about that usually involved uh, 
going to the limits of the body or putting yourself in a vulnerable position in front of an audience or doing what you don't know how to do because you say these guys are not specialists of performance but they did something very staged, the three of them. And, um, and it was really uh, efficient because it entertained the audience, the audience enjoyed it. Even with the second one, I mean the people that understood the device stayed and uh, appreciated it, I guess. So, well, I mean, my question was more like having this stage um, and this public like we have here, staying in this format, how, how does how does this feel in terms of the interesting experiment that it is to keep exactly the same kind of theatrical device? Well, it's interesting that you say this. Um, uh, over the last couple of years, there have been many attempts to bring uh, visual artists into uh, the theater on, on stage, working with performance. Uh, Il Tempo del Postino is a one example, and I think the uh, performance biennial in, in New York Performer is another example of a large-scale project that recently been launched um, that tried to operate in this in-between space between dance, theater, performance, art, visual arts. And um, I have to say that I always felt that uh, very similar to what you say, that um, as soon as artists enter the space of, of theater, they actually become m sometimes more uh, theatrical than people who actually really work within theater themselves, um, really trying to adopt the devices that are given to them in terms of the separation with the audience and, and all the sort of very traditional elements of a, of a theater. But I felt that with your proposal, uh, that wasn't really uh, um, the case at all. Whether there is a beginning or an end, I don't even know. Uh, you have seven guys up there that are going to torture this, this, this poor character. Yeah, I mean, probably the, the, the interesting aspect is that this um, acting up there is going to be acting, but it's also going to be real uh, in terms of they're going to really be uh, beating up these things. So the violence performed is going to be real violence. It's not going to be uh, 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 a simulation. They're, they're really going to leave out this force and, uh, and give it to the public, as, as I was saying. But yeah, I mean, the, the risk factors are, are minimal, but it's true that we will be in presence of people that are not usually uh, around the art audience and uh, are a little bit even physically um, uh, curious because their, their body is the, their artwork, so they entertain this uh, appearance of theirs as a, as a war machine and as also a visual system of warning the people around them. It's, it's very primitive, it's a very animal thing that they're doing, but not more animal than uh, the way each one of us entertains his own body and his own aspect and his own um, social status or how we present ourselves to the others. So it's just a, a, an allegory of all these things that go on in the social space. That's the way we see it, I guess. Well, when we had the, uh, the rehearsals with the fighters, I think um, my emotions were going between embarrassment, uh, shock, disgust. Um, there was a lot of things that came up when I was watching uh, them doing it, and, and also the pleasure that they took in doing it. And I don't know, maybe, James can talk a little bit about the fighters themselves because you had uh, um, interaction with them, you worked with them a little bit. I mean, th what we're watching here um, on the monitor is a kind of different thing. I mean, actually, I, would have, I wanted these kind of guys to do this, or we wanted these kind of guys. These guys are evil. I mean, they're, they're really nasty. I mean, basically, they teach this kind of combat where... They, they kill you straight away. I mean, there's no sport, they just kill you. The guys that, um, on Saturday, they're real athletes, they're real professionals, they have a real um, bonding between them. It's, it's very, it's beautiful to watch them, actually, and they're, they're really into what they do. I mean, they're, they're born to fight. I mean, they're, it's a kind of complete workout. They come from the Miami Fight Club. 
How are we doing with time? Well, I don't know. Are we going to have questions from the audience? So maybe we should open the, the, the panel and uh, see if there's any questions in the audience. Maria Veronica Leon from Ecuador, uh, living in Paris. About the entertainment and shopping, it is very interesting words because I have to see it. I cannot develop it. Sorry. So um, I really want to know if the galleries, the creators, or the people that show the artists are really interested more than the priority, economical priority, to be focused on the potential clients to develop really an uh, entertaining and an interaction with the public, um, to get the public in through the essence of the artwork, because the difference between a common shopping, if I can call as common shopping, dresses and whatever, is not the same, it could be a complex shopping, because of course art involves another kind of uh, intellectual and anemic uh, level. So I really wanted to know if you have conscience as creators and galleries others uh, that uh, it's important to develop this entertainment because it's not like that. If I as a curator would develop the idea of complex shopping. No, 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 no. I say you talk about shopping and it is not the same because a common shopping doesn't involve other criteria as artist art shopping, like you uh, nomad this. So in that case, if the, the people who work for this ferry or others uh, develop a real work to get people and not just the economical process to sell works of pieces of art, if uh, you can feel here a real compromise about those galleries and responsibles to get the people and to satisfy this uh, presumé uh, entertainment. Entertainment presumé. I'm sorry, I don't speak English very well. But maybe it's a question for Jens, but um, of course, I mean, I was, when I was formulating these things in a brute way, uh, shopping, entertainment, etc., I'm using allegories and analogies too. Why? It's the same process that we see, uh, uh, I mean, what we see there is not what we're going to see on Saturday and so on. So we are working on these shifts and uh, uh, we are trying to make sense through uh, comparing and, and um, how would I say, differentiating things and situations. So, of course, a performance shouldn't be entertaining. Of course, the performance should be a, a matter of life and death, and so should be uh, an artwork. I mean, uh, the then these things are for sale. It's pretty natural in a world where more or less everything is for sale. But this doesn't necessarily affect the motivations of the artist. It affects the formats. We were discussing about the formats, what a format becomes when uh, when people are docile with it or when people want to please the audience and when they are in a situation where they are appreciated artists and they do not want to put the public in a moment of discomfort, which happened yesterday in two performances at least that were very comfortable for the public. The second one was kind of problematic, but still kind of tasteful, let's say. Um, I'm not sure this is tasteful, for example. Uh, I was not talking exactly about performances. In that, in that case, I understand. I do talk about the general fairy. So I was talking about the entire spirit. If we can talk about spirit more than the commercial level, if you, the spirit of the fairy, how people feel this uh, supposed entertainment. I mean, I was talking about a, a real compromise of a people that work for these more than the, uh, the sales, that's it, more than the shopping, like you say. Do you have a question? I would like to know. 
You want me to stand up? Okay. Hello, my name is Hello. Rafael Castoriano. I would like to know how Miami is treating you. And uh, that's what I would like to know, what's happening in this city and how everything The artist. How is Miami treating you, James? It's okay. It's <laughs> I don't like the beach. <laughs> now the weather is nice, and um, also it's the third time we come, so we start to know some nice places to go to eat. No, I don't know. Um, it's fine. It's an interesting city. There are. Uh, lots of illegal things going on and uh, it's unfortunate we do not have time to explore the um, criminal world uh, of Miami more closely but we see a lot of it inside the fair uh, with how the work uh, is distributed and how people are charged and this is um, very interesting. Now, we, we didn't see much many police cars this year because we stayed around the convention center but uh, in the past years we have seen some arrests some pretty violent things going on business uh, hello yes i was uh, wondering if uh, either of you three have uh, participated in any of these i mean they're they're doing these violence acts on bob is it bob his bob, name yeah, yeah. i'm bob has bob any of you stands for uh, um Buddy Bogey. opponent bag. <laughs> well, have you guys uh, gotten into it with Bob uh, just for the experience of it to see uh, what motivates these fighters or how, what they are experiencing, you know, out of curiosity? I mean, I, I guess I have that feeling quite often of wanting to punch somebody in the face. So, <laughs> no, I haven't, no. Well, what you see on the videos here is also, these are also professional fighters. And I've looked at this uh, uh, object very closely. And if I uh, interact with it, nothing that what you see on the video is happening. Yeah. This thing is basically not moving, even if I ha throw all my weight against <laughs> it. So it's a very different experience. And you kind of really get a feeling for how physical the fighters are actually interacting uh, mm -hmm. with this uh, object. OK, thank you. Um, did I hear at the beginning, did you say it was uh, autobiographical? Were you describing it in that way? This uh, performance piece? Uh, no? <laughs> uh, this one? Or, uh, you were talking about performances and I kept hearing the word autobiographical. No, I was talking about uh, the performance of Simon Fujiwara and Chris Martin yesterday okay. that actually in very different ways um, came back to um, their, uh, I mean, I'm sure he's saying something that is not exact and it's a little bit brutal, but the, to the, um, yeah, the early emotions in, in their youth and their childhood almost on how they became artists and going through different steps of the main emotions that caused, of course it was like a very uh, elaborate reconstruction, they were not talking about their life in a spontaneous way, they were not supposed to, but it was very graceful and very worked on, you know, how they were building their own image of artists and how this work on the um, presentation of their subjectivity of young, successful, talented men was made in relationship to their uh, artwork because the, as soon as they were outside of the white cube, it felt like what was to present was themselves, like the subject that actually produces this, this uh, art. So it was very interesting for us, I guess, to see that, but I cannot say that we are in the same type of dynamic as we are researching on other problems. Hi. Hi. Uh, I 
I want to ask. Um, I was. I just came by. Um, I want to ask why why the doll is why the doll is a man and it's not a woman, and also uh, why how you choose the characteristic of the doll. The like why the why why the why how come like the enemy becomes like a kind of a it has specific characteristic and it has specific features. Yeah, this a, is a human characteristic. Yeah, the, and not this, it's not this a mask. Something we were talking about at the beginning actually it's a man because uh, uh, I mean for obvious reasons I guess uh, it's more exciting for uh, the fighters to fight another the the image of another man but usually actually these uh, punching bags are uh, um, just a bag huh? and this time we were fascinated by this uh, object and we actually uh, made him into into a, into a ready-made because he, it has these human features which are necessary to uh, uh, experiment tactics of uh, breaking the nose or exploding the eardrums or poking the eyes. So they really need to have this face and these different parts of the body uh, displayed and present on the surface to punch. But we just saw uh, a punch mannequin uh, in the shape of a child. So maybe we can all do uh, further research and find uh, a woman, Bob. For the moment, we haven't found it. So I think we uh, need to wrap up. Thank you very much for uh, your Thank time. You. And thanks to all of you for coming. <laughs>